All right, and we are going live on Facebook. Hello, everyone. I'll also share my screen before we get going, um, just to do a short and brief introduction. Hello, wherever you are tuning in from, welcome to the Art Gallery of Windsor's uh, Red Work in Conversation with Shamara Hogarth and Catherine Hurd. My name is Sophie Hinch, and I'm the Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the Art Gallery of Windsor. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, before we get going, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, before we start, I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. So while this conversation and recording is happening digitally today, I want to acknowledge that I'm physically situated on Anishinaabe territory, the traditional territory of, of the three fires confederacy of First Nations comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And today, the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy are represented by Walpole Island First Nation, and we want to state our respect of the historical and ongoing authority of Walpole Island First Nation over its territory. I'll do some brief introductions before we get into our discussion, which will be followed by a question and answers period. So if you have any questions for both of our artists today, you can submit them directly in the Q&A function, or if we don't have time and don't get to all the questions, you can also follow up with Catherine by email. We'll be sure to drop it in the chat as well um, for future reference. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge our co-presenters for part one and part two of this program, the Niagara Artist Center. Um, and the Textile Museum of Canada, and a special shout out to Natasha Pedros, Stephen Remus, and Leah Sanchez, who have been wonderful collaborators. The Textile Museum of Canada aims to ins inspire understanding of human experience through textiles. Um, and it's the only museum in Canada delivering programs and exhibitions dedicated solely to textile arts, which is a perfect fit for today. Um, Oh, I believe that the, my apologies, the text is flipped. So the Textile Museum of Canada um, and the Niagara Artist Center is one of the oldest arts uh, run organization in Canada founded in 1969 as a collective of working artists. And the NAC believes that the arts and critical dialogue on the arts are integral to a healthy community. Um, so right on theme for today. If you're new to the Art Gallery of Windsor, we encourage you to find us online at agw.ca. We have so many amazing programs and happenings, events, videos, talks, uh, workshops. So again, feel free to visit us at agw.ca for more information. I'd also like to present part two of the program. So the talk is part one and the part two uh, will be hosted by the Textile Museum of Canada on Sunday, May 9th uh, from two to four, um, which will be an online sewing circle led by both Catherine and Shamara. Um, we will embroider patches that will be included in Red, Red Work, the Emperor of Atlantis and you're encouraged to engage in dialogue and idea exchange. You can register at textilemuseum.ca. All skill levels are welcome and you can request your free embroidery kit by April 15th uh, to ensure that your kit will arrive on time. And the Textile Museum of Canada presents Social Being, which is a new six month dig digital program and project that will support and explore the human impulse to interact with others through textile. Social Being will capture over 15 public programs from April to September 2021, and the project will bring together um, people together at a time when the global pandemic stresses limited opportunities for physical social interaction. It will also shine a light on some of today's pressing social matters. So that will be part two of this program. And here are both of the artists that will be speaking to get today. Our moderator, Shamara Hogarth, is a textile artist and designer with a background in humanities research based between Brampton and Calgary. And her textile collections explore Jamaican culture in the South and the inherent capabilities of textile as a storytelling medium. 
Her practice utilizes weaving, screen printing, digital printing, felting, embroidery, and more recently, explorations in 3D printing. And Catherine Hurd's textile work is simultaneously attractive and repulsive as it delves into primal anxieties about the body. Frequently, she uses historical craft techniques as foils for abject subject matter, and her work has been exhibited around the globe, and it's held in many private and permanent collections. Catherine Hurd is a professor at the University of Windsor and is represented by Birch Contemporary Gallery in Toronto. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks, Sophie. Hi, Catherine. It's great to see you, even though it's from a distance. And congrats again on this partnership. It's fantastic to see the project engaging with even more people. Uh, I guess one of the things that I'd want to start off with you being able to talk about is the inspiration for where this project is now, because I recall that it was inspired by your Dance Macabre project in 2015, 2017, around that time. Could you talk a bit about that idea of engaging with the ways that we think we know the world and how you wanted to really kind of excavate that? Absolutely. Thank you, Shamara. Um, as you said, yes, this project began as part of a show that was curated by Linda Jansma called Puppet Act at the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. Uh, back in 2015 and the original intent for that piece was to create um, three panels of embroidery like the ones that you see behind me. Um, unfortunately, I only got to make two because uh, embroidery is really time intensive. Um, so after I finished the project, uh, it just didn't feel complete and I wanted to uh, continue working on it. So it's become a very long term project and one that it's quite possible will I, I can actually foresee it becoming, you know, kind of continuing even after this version's being exhibited. I'll just quickly uh, share a screen. This is um, a sketch of, um, oops, hopefully what, sorry, I'm not sure if we're sharing the right screen here. Let me try that again. Okay, so hopefully what you can see is um, a row of skeletons who are dancing. Is that uh, showing up? Yeah, they're showing up. Lovely. So um, this is sort of the sketch for uh, what red work uh, the um, Emperor of Atlantis will look like. And what you see there is actually the original title, um, which has changed now. Um, so we're looking at um, probably hopefully 15 meters of this sewn panel and um, uh, 13 dancing skeletons. So this is really a piece that is about um, the way we think about history and about the way that history feels overwhelming. Um, one of the key inspirations for the piece was a piece of writing by Walter Benjamin. Um, it's part of his thesis on the philosophy of history from 1940. And I just wanna read you a really brief quote um, because it sums up um, a lot of the thinking behind the piece really well, I think. And I'm just going to quickly show you a picture of the Angelus Novellus, no, Angelus Novellus, which is the work that um, he was, referring to in this piece of writing. Um, a clay painting named Angelus Novellus, Novus shows an angel looking as though he's about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned to the past. His wings are spread. Where we perceive a chain of events, he sees one single catastrophe which keeps piling wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It is caught in his wings with such violence 
that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. Um, and really, you know, this piece is about that feeling of the overwhelming injustices of history and the things that we as individuals, I think, feel helpless to be able to change. Yeah, it's, it's that sentiment of being doomed to repeat history, that we're not learning from it. We don't really see the continuity of it. And we think that everything has been new and we're just doing this for the first time this century when human beings have just been repeating this cycle. So it's kind of good to see that the work is really saying, here is something that happened in very recent history, even though we think of it as so far removed from, and it's still happening, it changes its face. So yeah, it is, Ah, it's eye opening, it's humbling. <laughs> so it's great to kind of see a reckoning with that, I guess. And then the project, the way that the project is set up to kind of talk about this encourages that through this community, community approach where people come in either knowing something about it beforehand or knowing nothing, and then all being able to talk about it while they're working on these pieces, seeing these images for the first time and having to really reckon with even how they previously thought about it or not at all. And yeah, it's again, humbling, very humbling. And I think that even brings me to how I got involved in the project when we first spoke about it, where a lot of these things, because I wasn't born here, and a lot of these things I didn't know about, specifically when it comes to uh, the residential schools. I learned about them probably when I was at York, around 2016. And I hadn't really even reckoned with a lot of the imagery around it until the point that we started, like I started working on this with you in about 2018, if I recall. <laughs> and, uh, it was, I think, a very similar feeling a lot of people had when they when they came into the project. Do you feel, do you find that a lot of people have that kind of uh, response, reaction to the work? Yeah, one of the things that's been very interesting about the project um, is because it invites people to select an image to embroider. Um, we've, uh, there's just such a, a different response from people. Some people who want to embroider an image from an event they remembered or they want to commemorate or that they want to think more about. And many um, people have said, you know, they've chosen the residential school images because it's something that they feel they need to consider and to think about how do we redress this injustice. Uh, where other people will say, no, I, I don't want to embroider an image of injustice. I want to embroider something that is, um, of a more positive intent. And so we actually give people also the option to choose um, a historical embroidery and um, you know, to, to choose something that is maybe less, um, less problematized, yes. Um, <laughs> and some people also ask that certain images be included. So for example, um, one of the, uh, one of my student, or I guess she wasn't a student, she was an assistant. Uh, she was a student at the Ontario College of Art, um, but was working with me in a studio assistant role as opposed to a student role. And she's Iranian and said, you know, could we do images of the Iranian revolution? And so she became responsible for that whole group of images and is actually, um, as we speak, creating more images related to um, her memories of being a child in Iran and about that history and where it's led to today. Yeah, I recall her saying that it was important to her to kind of show not necessarily the worst or the best of anything, but the reality as she remembered it and remembered hearing about it from her parents and grandparents. So, and it was really important to her to do that. So it's, it's nice that people who can take on, I guess, a bit of this um, 
mental, if I want to say that, <laughs> of bringing in something that's very personal to them in this format, this very traditional format, this penny square embroidery <laughs> format that really engages with other people who knew, maybe knew nothing about it beforehand. I think it's a, I think it's great to have that opportunity. But I, I do know one of the questions that comes up uh, ever so often is the the idea of um, ownership of and usage of some of these images because they're they're very culturally sensitive and they can be seen as problematic and rightfully so people will question how respectfully um, the images are being used and where the images are being taken from. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I completely agree. The, the choice of images has been um, sometimes very difficult because on one hand, I want to talk about the traumas of history, but on the other hand, I want it to be in a way that um, promotes activism as opposed to, you know, simply dwelling on things that are negative. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's hard to talk about those events without showing images related to them. So um, one of the questions that comes up particularly is, is it okay for you to show images of residential schools? What gives you the right to show those images? And should you be asking for permission from Indigenous communities to use those images? And that was a question that I really had, the first time it was asked, I really went away and thought about it long and hard and deep and thought, you know, have I transgressed a border here that I shouldn't have? And Eventually, I did, after much thought, come to the conclusion that, yes, I should be showing these images and that maybe they weren't images that required specific permission. And I'll explain that reasoning because, you know, this whole question of artists appropriating imagery is becoming more and more complex. Um, certainly, we know there have been a lot of legal trials around people like Jeff Koons and Andy Warhol, who used other people's images in their artwork. But even more than that, um, when does an image belong to a community? Or when can we use, you know, we want to avoid using images that are sacred or images of things that communities don't want to be shown. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, all of these images are from, uh, have all been published previously. So many of them are from the Truth and Reconciliation Report or from reporting about uh, the injustice of the residential schools in Canada and about injustices to Indigenous peoples. Um, as well, these are images that as someone who is of settler descent. And I say that word settler with maybe quotations around it because recently I read something that said, is settler a good word to be using? Because it, it sort of implies that there was no settlement prior to us arriving or North you know, uh, Europeans arriving. And so it, it's a term that I'm questioning, but I'm using it right now because it is the term that we're using most commonly now to speak uh, about people who are of European descent, who were part of a colonial um, uh, project in, in North America and who, you know, who have committed, I think, a lot of injustice on Indigenous peoples. Um, so as a settler, you know, these are images that I feel that my own personal history is entangled with, that you know, these are schools that existed during my lifetime, many of them, and they were built during the time of my grandparents and my parents. So, you know, these are something that I feel I have a responsibility for, and maybe part of that responsibility is acknowledging the existence of that history and recognizing my part in that history and also thinking about, you know, how do I as an individual who has very little power in the, you know, in the broader sense, but as an artist who has a voice, can I do something positive by using those images? Um, so the other final thing is that 
asking permission, while on the surface it sounds simple, is actually a very complicated problem because I'm not sure who to ask permission from. Um, recognizing that, you know, it could mean the place where I'm living now or the place I lived when I started the project. But these schools existed all the way across Canada. So does it mean going to each individual community related to a school? Um, becomes even more complicated when you realize that the children in the schools were not all necessarily from the community closest by. They were from many communities. And so it really becomes a very difficult question of who to ask permission from. Um, I think as well, it raises the question of should I be asking permission from other communities whose histories are referenced in the piece? And in the end, I, I simply decided no, that, you know, as an artist, I take responsibility for the images I show and uh, in the piece. And I hope that the images are doing something more positive than they are negative. So while on one hand, I realize that some of the images in the piece may be traumatic for individuals to see, I hope that that's softened by the fact that this is a piece that contextualizes histories of uh, trauma and histories of injustice. And that I think we should be putting the residential schools and the treatment of indigenous peoples in North America in that history of injustice in the same way we talk about other wars and other other histories of, of terror and horror. And I do hope that with, with uh, the project gaining even a wider recognition that more people from these communities can engage with it, even if it is to critique it, but to have their voices in it, because that's the, I guess, what I've seen that is that's, that's the point of having this community outreach approach because we've had people in the year that I was working um, on this with you, we've had people from so many diverse backgrounds come in and they have contributed a lot of the imagery, a lot of the conversations that lead people to question even one image, is, one image that we see on a Sunday or a Saturday when we're sewing and they go and they read up on it and they come back and we have all these conversations. So I really do hope that uh, more people from these communities can come in and add their voices to it helps that conversation along. And these are histories, as you say, that really deserve to be properly reckoned with at the forefront of everything, not an afterthought when we think of what is Canadian history and then we leave out so many people. <laughs> so I do, I do hope that it gets it gets more people involved from these communities. Okay, but speaking of the actual red work, so when we, <laughs> when somebody comes in and they say, what is red work? Why red? <laughs> what would, because I, I remember thinking of that the same way. I'm thinking, oh, of all the embroidery colors to use, why red? But then that red was the color that was available in the 1890s when this practice like really started. <sighs> yeah, I think it was a, a matter, like it would have probably been like a matter cotton dye, the turkey red, the Turkish red, I forget, where did it get that name? <laughs> Sorry, I go on tangents when I think about these things, <laughs> but I do, <laughs> but I do remember coming and thinking, why red? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, I think absolutely there was this history of using um, turkey red, uh, which wasn't from Turkey. <laughs> but, I figured, because um, I didn't <laughs> but it did come from away, right? It came to Britain and there was actually a bit of um, subterfuge in that matter plant roots were stolen so they could be actually grown in Europe. Um, so industrial espionage. Um, but it actually, uh, even though it had, these were um, a color that had been available um, from the 1700s, 1600s and 1700s in Europe, it was a color that was really hard to make. It was this long, complicated, smelly, awful process. Um, but in the 1860s, 1870s, I think, I'm forgetting the exact date, um, the first synthetic um, red dye was developed and it, uh, the permanent dye. So it was a dye that wasn't going to run. And it created this enormous excitement and that was when red work really took off. So in the uh, 
by the 1880s, there was this real bloom and interest in this. Um, also tied to raising, uh, rising rates of literacy, that there were a lot of penny magazines available. And one of the ways that they promoted themselves, especially for women's magazines, was selling penny square patterns so that you would want to buy you know, the magazine to get the patterns to put in your quilt. So frequently we see uh, patterns that repeat because everybody would be buying these same patterns. And I'm just gonna reach over here um, and show everybody one. Uh, this was a very, this dog pattern was a very, very popular pattern. And it actually shows up currently, I think at least six or seven times in, um, there, there you can see it right here is that mm -hmm. same dog pattern. <laughs> um, so, you know, people would, would really get excited about these patterns and the very popular patterns you see repeated over and over again in the red work. It's, uh, it was interesting to see the kinds of motifs and the patterns that people would choose to, to use even for this project. I think there was one floral motif that I kept <laughs> coming back to every time I was going to do a new demonstration of how to do the stem stitch and the outlines. And it's like, oh, let's choose this one. I'm like, why? Because it, it was I, not, I wouldn't say easy to replicate, but it was pretty. It was nice. It was straightforward. So. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that these pop these patterns would have been super popular. I just pick this one and we have a, and then I guess it would be, you do these patterns and you put them together and the highlights would be to have a quilt by the time that you're done getting these penny squares together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, there's another quilt that I'll just take a minute to show everybody mm -hmm. um, because this was actually the, I think one of the most popular quilt patterns. This is uh, Ruby Scott McKim's colonial quilt. And it was actually images from the colonial quilt that got me started with this whole project um, back in the very early, um, you know, back in the, I guess, 2014, when I was working on the project for the Robert McLaughlin Gallery. Mm -hmm. So this quilt, it's called the colonial quilt. Um, and it really struck me, I'm just going to go to a screen share again, how the imagery in this quilt, and I'm just hopefully, right now you can see a picture of the colonial quilt um, on screen. The, it features a number of images of indigenous people, but all of the names on the quilt and the quilt blocks are named. So when you bought the patterns, this is what you would see. You'd get all of the patterns in the set, um, but they were named after the explorers. So there are indigenous people present, but none of them are named. Um, so there's this discomfort around that. But also for me, um, the quilt blocks with indigenous people in them, either they were unnamed, even though of course, these were people who had names. These are, you know, this is depicting a treaty, mm -hmm. uh, both the Henry Hudson image and Penn's treaty. Uh, and we know the names of who those indigenous people were, but they aren't yeah. on the quilt. Um, we also see the Captain John Smith image with Pocahontas. Again, she's unnamed. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise, it's emphasizing the primitive. So, you know, when I began collecting red work and seeing these images. Um, and here you can actually see another one. There's from the Ruby Scott McKim quilt. And um, sorry, I'm just looking for that other image. It's sort of funny because everything's backwards. Um, so I'm having trouble locating. You can see it on the screen, but I can't. Anyway, you, you can see other ones up there. I can just, where is it? There, that's the one I was looking for. Um, so these images that are actually from old quilts. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking at them, the discomfort of these images where, you know, when people included them in their quilts, they were about a triumphal conquering of the land. And today we look at them and we see images of stereotypes and images related to injustice. So that was really one of the things that triggered the beginning of this quilt. 
you know, that people would have these on their beds, this quilt that really tells the story of injustice in America. Um, this is actually ironically the colonial justice quilt square. Oh. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it tells about a very uncomfortable history. So this would be on people's beds. And I began thinking, you know, what happens when we start taking images from today's history and integrating them? So some of the first images that I designed were related to the war on terror. This is the 9-11 quilt block. This is from Abu Ghraib prison. This is also from Abu Ghraib, Abu Ghraib. Um, and also some squares, oops, and that's out of, out of range from what you can see. Also some squares that were related to the history of war that I weirdly came across a whole bunch of quilt squares that were from uh, World War II. And I'm just gonna see if I can locate, and there you can see one of them, the tank image. So this was a days of the week set of images, very weird um, that somebody would want to embroider those images and have them in their home on their beds yeah. Yeah. But, but I guess that's, that's that's why it becomes um important I guess to have the conversations and name the people because as you said we we know the names of the people that were in in these photos so when people take these images now and they embroider them and they put their signatures on them and they put the, the they sign the or stitch I should say rather the names of the individuals in it it's sort of a, a reckoning with it that obviously wouldn't have been done before when it was being done traditionally, but it does kind of change that, that normal usage of having this as just a, I didn't want to say that, to say this primitive Indian patch, like where, uh, yeah, very problematic phrasing, but to really flip it on its head and say, no, let's name the people that are in these images because they're people and there are stories behind all of this. So even with the tanks and some of the images from um, the war in Vietnam, like people are naming them when they do these, when they do these patches, no. So it's, it's nice to see that sort of flipping or changing of the narrative around, around those images. I, I think also the importance of people putting their own names on the quilt, um, because this was also, I'm just stepping aside to grab a, another quilt here. This was another big part of the red work tradition was that you would, you would often include your name and the names were actually quite prominent. So a lot of people feel a bit uncomfortable mm -hmm. embroidering their initials really largely on the quilt. But this was actually part of the red work tradition, whether it was a community quilt like the one I just showed you, mm -hmm. or whether it was, oops, I'm just looking for a particular quilt here. Is this it? Oh, I've lost it. Um, or whether it was a particular quilt by an individual where often the name was framed in the center, very, very large, along mm -hmm. with the date. Um, so that, has, that hasn't been the practice with the with the people contributing now in this project. They've been choosing the smallest fonts in like the bottom left corner of the square. <laughs> well, the funny thing is now that I'm actually designing all the images, their initials are getting much, much bigger. <laughs> so this is actually um, an image that was recently requested by uh, Brigitte Romeo, who's living mm -hmm. here in Windsor. And you can see the initials BR are quite large. And this is an image of the statue of Columbus being torn down. Mm -hmm. So when people request their kits, you'll, you'll get something like this, as well as um, the embroidery thread that you need, a needle threader, um, a return envelope, and for people who need it, an embroidery hoop. And again, all skill levels are fantastically welcome because we'll walk through everything together, get my camera set up ready to just kind of show the intricacies of it. I think people feel nervous sometimes about getting started with embroidery. Like once you get that basic stem stitch, you're good to go. Yeah. And it's always nice to kind of see people gain that confidence around sewing. I know that happened for me as well, even through the course of working on this project, like I knew how to sew before, but then being, like in the position of teaching people how to do it just got me way more comfortable with the process. So 
yep. it was it was a good experience and I'm actually just opening up the envelope here because I wanted to show people that you will also get a, um, often I write a note, uh, but the more important thing here is that really clear set of instructions with diagrams about exactly how to do the stitches. And there are also lots of really good tutorials on, um, on um, the internet. So they will be successful at doing their own squares. Indeed. Oh, sorry. Oh my. Yeah, tech issue there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it, it's good to see. It's good to see people that have been signing up for for this because again, it encourages more conversation with that. The images again that people will choose to put their their signatures more largely on are interesting to see, uh, but. It's, it's nice to see those conversations happening, even sometimes when they may be uncomfortable conversations. But again, that reckoning with history is a, an ever present thing. And what better way to do it than with community that you can have these healthy conversations, you can have this dialogue with while doing something that is tactile and stimulating. So, so it's great to see. Oh, did I mute? Should we answer some questions? Oh, oh yeah, I see that we have uh, quite a few coming up. Are we good on time? I think so. Oh, one of the questions is where um, to request a, a, a kit. And I see, um, actually someone has put the link here. So if you just go to the website, um, there is a link and when you click it, you'll fill out a form that just asks for your address and what image you've choose. You've choosed, you've chosen, oh dear. Um, so would anyone like to ask any questions? Feel free to um, type them into the chat. Or Shamara, if you have another question, I'm happy <laughs> Just to, to jump, it, so jump in. There is a question in the Q&A from Derek. Um, so I'll read out their question for you. Um, have you thought of, if you haven't already, working in solidarity directly with those who are seeking redness, uh, such as the survivors of residential schools who took the government to court for uh, red risk? Um, that might be one way of making yourself more directly accountable to the communities who are affected by the histories you are using in your works and developing your practice through. Um, mm -hmm. And really weaving in the calls from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as well as the final report from the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Commission. Um, so if you could speak to yeah. that, that would be great. That's actually a wonderful idea, Derek. And to be honest, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it. So yes, I will. Um, I will follow up on that. Thank you for the suggestion. There is a question also in the chat from Courtney asking, how do you see your artistic development over the last 20 years? So asking you to look back. <laughs> That's a very, very big question. Um, I think the one thing that's remained constant in my work is um, an interest in textiles. So my earliest works uh, that I exhibited uh, professionally were textile based works. And I have worked in a very wide range of media, but textiles seem to be something I've always come back to. And I've always been interested in the political aspects of textiles how um, they tie into themes like the women's movement and the peace movement, but also really their subversive nature. You know, this piece is all about hiding things in the quilts. So even when people are looking at the piece, the sculpted skeletons that hang in front of the curtains look at first like they're the, the subject of the work. And it's only when you spend time with the piece and you really start to look at those images behind that are in these embroidered curtains that you are able to piece together what, what the work is really about. There's another question as well in the chat from Sindra. Uh, what is the relevance of the title? 
I'm so happy you asked that because it's something I was hoping to get to talk about. Um, the Emperor of Atlantis was an opera that was written by um, Victor Ullman. The libretto was by Peter Kine. And it was written when they were both prisoners in the Nazi concentration camp of Theresienstadt. Um, so this was the camp where a lot of artists and intellectuals were sent. Uh, so it was also the show camp where uh, people from the Red Cross, for example, were taken um, to see the conditions that people were living in. Um, so there was a lot of creative activity in Theresienstadt. And, you know, this opera, uh, the libretto tells the story of um, death abdicating from his role because he looks on the world and he sees such injustice and he sees that man and the motorized chariots of war are doing his work for him. So death simply says, I'm, I'm going on strike. And the first sign that things are going horribly wrong is that a messenger arrives on the stage and says, you know, the prisoner won't die. We're, we've shot the prisoner, we've hung the prisoner, they simply won't die. Um, the emperor of Atlantis of the title uh, was thought to be um, uh, a metaphor for Hitler. And in fact, this opera was never performed uh, during its author and, and uh, composer's lifetime. They, um, uh, although it was being rehearsed at some point, it seems that the guards realized the satirical nature of the opera and um, both Kine and uh, Ullman were sent to Auschwitz where they died. The uh, opera was, was saved by the person who was acting as the camp librarian and it wasn't performed actually until 1975 for the first time. So yeah, the title of this piece is really important to me um, in thinking about uh, this problem of war and this problem of man's continuing un injustice to man. And how are we able to do this to one another as individuals? And how do we live with the knowledge that, that we are able to do this to people and that we're able to turn a blind eye? And also the necessity that, you know, if sometimes as individuals, we don't turn a blind eye we can't survive psychologically. So it's, it's an incredibly complex problem. Excellent. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Akash asking, has moving away from using exact squares or the embroidery patches changed the nature of the work? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, there is a very practical reason for doing this, which of course is that red work squares would, from different quilts wouldn't work together. Um, and of course it references the, the other quilting tradition we all know, which is the crazy quilt. But one thing it has done, which I've really liked is it allows me to uh, put images that relate to one another uh, together. So for example, uh, looking at uh, some of these images that are behind me, here I've put uh, Little Red Riding Hood the colonial, uh, a square from the colonial quilt. This is like the cabin in the woods. Uh, again, Little Red Riding Hood, very, very lascivious looking wolf there. I don't know if you can see him. And then um, the image of an indigenous person. And this is uh, an embroidery from a historical quilt. So for me, this whole little grouping talks about, you know, how maybe we as North Americans imagine the forest, you know, there's this fantastical um, fictional space where the imaginary Indian maybe coexists with Little Red Riding Hood and with the fantasy of the pioneer. Um, similarly, I have frequently put uh, images um, from Abu Ghraib this is the image of the prisoners stand, uh, being forced to stand on a box and guards have attached wires to his hands and told him that if he falls, uh, he'll be electrocuted because there's water on the floor. Um, and I've often put images from Abu Ghraib 
next to images of dogs. Uh, dogs were very common in the historical quilts because of course they're the sign of home and protection and fidelity, but they were also used to attack and to terrorize prisoners. Um, I'm just looking here to see. Yeah, so here again, there's a dog in the actual, oops, let me pull that down a little, in the actual image, a bit hard to see. Um, again, another dog there next to the 9-11 uh, image. Yeah. I guess as we're, we're talking about subversive narratives too, there's a question here that asks about um, potential connections to one of Carol Walker's uh, fabric pieces. I have, I think I have an idea of which one it is, but I'm not sure what, um, which one specifically Sindra is referring to. Uh, because I know that a lot, a lot of Kara Walker's work is that subversive, like you look at it initially and you see, oh, it's pretty, and then you come closer and you start seeing all the different motifs that she's using and the things she's referencing, and it's, it's very uncomfortable, <laughs> but it's, again, those very necessary conversations. Yeah, it's interesting, Cinder, that you uh, mentioned Kara Walker because not an artist who I had thought of consciously in the relation to this piece, but if I think about, you know, the structure of this piece and the structure of Kara Walker's work, particularly the work, uh, the paper cut work with the black paper cuts that are put on museum walls, um, there's absolutely a connection to the same kind of um, subversive imagery in the imagery pretending to be, you know, safe. In Kara Walker's case, the image of the silhouette that looks at first glance like that, you know, beautiful Victorian detailed silhouette work. And in my case, the imagery um, that at first glance looks like, you know, the homey American quilt that celebrates um, comfort, right, that we find on, on beds in our, in our homes. And I think along those lines too, there is quite an interesting question from Amanda um, asking, have you considered displaying some or part of the quilt on a bed or furniture like it would have been found in homes at that time? That is a really good question. Um, interestingly, I'm working on a series of oops, actual quilts um, where I am using whole quilts and then inserting uh, imagery into the quilt. So this is uh, the quilt that eventually will be um, the War on Terror quilt. So here you can see all of the original imagery of the quilt and then in a slightly different color, the imagery that I've created that's being buried in the quilt. Um, so there we have a heron and there's 9-11. But I, I think I've always envisioned these as hanging on a wall uh, rather than being horizontal. And it isn't until you've asked that question, Amanda, that I'm starting to think why. Um, and I'm not quite sure. So I'm going to have to think a little bit more on that one. Um, these ones are fairly far away from display right now, although I have to say this is my summer project, getting back to uh, these this quilt first and then a whole bunch of others because I've got a bunch of these really lovely traditional quilts that I'm quite excited about making interventions into. So there will be a quilt for the war on terror, the Vietnam War, the residential schools, uh, and so on. There's another question from Judith as well. Will you consider a web-based or web VR version of the piece so that people can explore intimately even after the lockdown? Wow, that's a really good idea. Um, I would love to do this. Uh, the website right now um, has a fair amount of documentation, but it's of individuals, uh, what individuals have contributed. So, uh, and that's actually something that we really need to update because I've got a whole bunch that need to be put up on there and that'll happen again this summer. But I've never thought of doing a VR version. I think that's a brilliant idea, so thank you. Um, going back to the Q&A box, um, there's a question from Courtney asking, are you familiar with the death with interruptions by Jose Saramago? Um, and 
Courtney mentions that it has a similar theme. Um, so I don't know if you're you're familiar with that specific work. I'm not. I love Jose Saramago though, um, and I will definitely look that up. Thank you for the suggestion. And there's also another question um, bringing up another artist and work um, by, uh, here's a question by Andy. Have you considered a patch of Paul Klee's Angelus Novus? That is so- Does that make a reference uh, to Benjamin's notion of history, uh, history too explicit? That is, no, no, I, I, you know, it's so, I'm just laughing because it is so funny you're asking that because I was thinking that this morning when I was looking for that image and thinking, why haven't I put it in yet? So yes, I am going to. Um, I'm not quite sure. I mean, certainly it can be a small patch here, but I also have some um, mid-sized pieces um, that I've been thinking of doing something with that are pillow shams. And that might actually make a really good intervention into one of the pillow shams. Um, I'm thinking a couple in particular, one that has a circular space in the center that's surrounded by flowers. And I have another that's um, a bunch of little um, gnomes or nymphs or something who are sitting on a limb of a tree. Um, so yeah, I, 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 it is in my mind. <laughs> Uh, another question um, from Jenny that just came up. What would it be like to insert the quilts into a colonial museum um, that purports to show a vignette of life at home? That would be amazing. Um, and I definitely, sh uh, I'm actually looking for venues for this work right now. And um, that's a really good idea. Um, and I may actually reach out to some of those historical homes. Um, my main concern would be, you know, can I convince someone to let me do that? Um, I think it'll take kind of a special curator to, um, to feel comfortable putting work that's potentially controversial into a historical home setting where people aren't necessarily expecting to uh, be confronted with difficult imagery, but I think it would be perfect. Like, and I can think, you know, Spadina House in Toronto would be amazing or the Grange attached to the AGO. So um, yes, I will think about that. Thank you for that question. So many great yeah, suggestions today. <laughs> I know, I'm getting all these great ideas. It's, it's a wonderful- Judith also mentioned the Museum of Vancouver as a potential uh, location. You know what? It's, it's funny. I actually sent, uh, I've been sending some letters around. I sent a letter to them and uh, I think that was one of the places that responded back to me saying they're a bit overwhelmed right now um, as a lot of small museums are trying to cope with the pandemic. But yes, absolutely. Um, historical houses would be the perfect setting for this. There's an, also a question from Susan asking, is this project limited to people in Ontario or Canada? This is so interesting, thank you. Uh, no, it's not at all. Um, mostly I have uh, right now reached out to people in Ontario and Quebec, but my goal ultimately is I would love to have representation from every province in Canada. And it's also open to international uh, participants. I'm actually proposing a paper to a conference in Sweden next year. Um, be wonderful to take it there, but we'll see what happens. I mean, it's, it's always a bit challenging to find ways of reaching out to different communities. Um, so one of the things I would say is for everyone here today, please feel free to share this widely. It's really meant for everybody. It's not, you don't have to be, we, in fact, this really isn't a project for artists. This is a project for, for people. Um, and it's access, very accessible in the sense that um, a red work square was often a first project for a pioneer child, right? You could be, you know, you'd, girls who are six, seven years old, five years old even, are starting to learn how to sew. And the youngest person actually who's participated in this project, I think was maybe eight or nine years old, a boy. Uh, and there have actually been a number of children who've come with their parents and in, ended up embroidering squares. So um, 
you know, if you have kids who you think would like to participate too, please invite them. Um, um, and I guess we have time for one more question before we um, close out for today. Um, from the Q&A box, Sindra also asks, why 13 skeletons? <laughs> Ah, yes. Well, unlucky number, right? Um, it actually was inspired by um, a few years ago, I traveled in uh, Brittany, in France. And we visited a medieval church that had murals from the 1300s that depicted 13 skeletons. And the skeletons represented um, all of the roles in the community. So, you know, you had the king, you had the priest, you had the serf, you had the musician. And I guess the, the, what the mural was trying to tell people was death is going to come for you all. <laughs> uh, so rather macabre reminder, but uh, that was, uh, it's, you know, often as artists, we, we make these little decisions, references to things that nobody else would know unless they asked. Um, but there is sometimes method in my madness. <laughs> And I think that was it for, for questions. I don't know if you wanted to conclude or if you had any um, last last words for today before we, uh, we end the, the talk. Um, really just to, to thank everybody for coming and especially to thank Shimara. I haven't seen Shimara for a couple of years. She's currently finishing her master's degree in Calgary. So it was just really wonderful to get to connect with you. Thank you to the Art Gallery of Windsor and to the Textile Museum and to the Niagara Artist Center and to all the members of those museums who've come out today and who are participating. And uh, Sophie, I'm gonna let you just put in a final word, maybe uh, talking about the next stage of this event where people can come and meet with Shamara and I again. Absolutely, so I'll just put up my uh, screen for everyone. Hopefully everyone can see it, so again, uh, in part two of the program hosted by the Textile Museum of Canada on Sunday, May 9th from two to four. We're inviting you to register. It's a free event. It's open to everyone. So you can register online at uh, textilemuseum.ca. Um, you can request your materials. I'll put it in the chat again, but directly from Catherine's website. Um, so you can head on over and visit Catherine's website and request a kit. Uh, we ask that you please request your kits before April 15th, just to ensure that there's enough time for the kits to arrive. Again, this is free and open to all, and uh, hopefully you'll register for part two and um, continue this wonderful dialogue that's happening here today. Um, so again, thank you, Shamara. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to the Textile Museum of Canada and the Niagara Artists uh, Centre as well. Um, and we hope that everyone has a really great rest of your weekend and we'll see everyone for part two.